Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ellen Mantis. I'm the director of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, for those of you that don't know anything about the Roundtable, the Roundtable um, provides a neutral forum to advance understanding of issues of importance to the chemical sciences, and we look to promote uh, exchange of uh, information um, among all the different sectors, government, industry, academic, and other. Normally, our activities are workshops that we have during the year, but this year, for 2020, we are excited to launch a series of webinars on emerging topics, and this is the first of our series, and today's topic is inorganic biohybrids. Uh, the format for today will be two presentations, uh, one by uh, Dr. Catherine Brown from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and the other by Daniel uh, Nasera from Harvard University. Uh, their biographical information is on our website, so you can read more about them there. Uh, after the presentations, we will have a moderated uh, question-answer session with the speakers. Uh, Mark Jones, who is a member of our Chemical Sciences Roundtable, will moderate that discussion. And to ask a question of the speakers, you simply submit your question via the chat feature. Uh, to do so, click on the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen and type in your message either to um, everyone or to Mark Jones. And Mark will ask questions on behalf of the audience. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brown, who will lead off the presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry, uh, getting the technical details uh, set. So hopefully everyone can see a full screen version of my slides now. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Katherine Brown. I'm a researcher in the redox biochemistry. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Um, yes. We see your um, presentation view. Uh, sorry, it's the correct view? No. No. Is that the correct view? Yes, thank you, Kate. Okay. Thank you, sorry everyone. Um, so uh, I'm Dr. Katherine Brown. Um, I'm a research scientist at the National Renewable Energy Lab in the Redox Biochemistry Group. Um, and I'm excited to tell you today about um, our work and the work of other, our colleagues in semi-artificial photosynthesis. Um, and really the work that we do is trying to use biohybrids to as model systems for understanding the fundamental processes of photocatalysis and photosynthesis. Uh, so we are really focused on basic science of how these processes work. Um, and just to start off, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we mean when we say artificial photosynthesis, because in the most general sense, we mean systems that uh, use water oxidation uh, to generate high energy electrons. But that can encompass an enormous amount of variety in terms of the kind of devices and science that's going on. Uh, so this is just three examples of many. Uh, so in the uh, top left uh, is a uh, system where you have water oxidation and fuel generation, in this case, hydrogen production, uh, occurring at separated electrodes that are then wired together. Um, here on the bottom, this is sort of a classic artificial synthesis take. It's a scheme that was first designed uh, or proposed by Art Nozick uh, in the 70s, where it's really reproducing the energy scheme that you see in photosynthesis of this offset between the water oxidation catalyst and the fuel producing catalyst, where they have these mashed energy schemes, which allows you to upconvert the energy and produce high energy electrons. And then over on the right, uh, we have um, Professor Nocera's work where he's taking this concept of wa splitting water and wiring it up to biology to create this artificial photosynthesis that's really connected to the biology of, um, that already exists. And obviously I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because he's gonna cover it later. Um, but really the point I, I'd like you to take home from this is that there's this enormous diversity in the concept of artificial photosynthesis. And if you Google this uh, in Google Scholar, you'll get 350,000 results. So there's an enormous diversity in what we call artificial photosynthesis and the kind of science that's going on. 
And given that diversity, I'd like to take a step back and look at the natural system one more time to give a grounding in how in our, we in our lab see photosynthesis and see the processes that we can learn from in the system. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with how photosynthesis works, but I'm going to go through it very briefly. Uh, so you have light absorption at photosystem two that generates a, a highly oxidizing hole that allows you to drive water oxidation. And those electrons are then processed through the membrane, through the plastoquinone pool to cytochrome B6F, through plastocyanin to PS1. And at PS1, you have absorption of another photon, uh, which creates a high energy electron that then gets tra transferred to ferredoxin and onto ferredoxin NADP reductase to produce these reduced uh, uh, electron sources for the cell in the form of NADPH and then reduced ferredoxin. Um, the other aspect of photosynthesis that I'd really like to point out here is that in addition to this moving of electrons, you also have the generation of this proton motive force, which is linked to ATPase and is another way that the cell uses photosynthesis to maximize the amount of energy it's getting out of this process. So in addition to moving electrons and creating these high energy reduced products, you're also creating this uh, proton motive force, which gives you the cell an, an additional um, source of energy. And uh, what this really means to me is that photosynthesis is more than just water splitting. It's actually a finely tuned system for moving charges and creating energy for the cell uh, on a higher level than just water splitting. Uh, so if we look at photosynthesis from a different perspective and we think about how this charge transfer is happening, you can see that the both photosystem one and photosystem two are designed to move charges to create long-lived charge separated states. Uh, and if we look at the work that's been done summarizing the, the time scales of these, you can see that each, elect, that each charge transfer step is extremely fast. So within a millisecond, uh, in both cases, uh, you get, or in a, yeah, you get charge separated states that have extremely long lifetimes and allow the cell to do a lot of chemistry. Um, and the other thing that this system creates is a extremely high quantum yield for the system. So Photosystem 1, for example, has a quantum yield near 100%. So that means almost all of the electrons that, you're, that are absorbed by Photosystem 1 result in a reduced product. And that's a system that artificial systems have yet to uh, match. Photosynthesis, particularly photosystem one, is extremely efficient. Um, and that's an element that we can really use photosynthesis to learn about how to generate artificial systems that can begin to match this. And in our group and in our colleagues' groups, the way to do this is with biohybrids, or the way to study this is with biohybrids. So there's one more element that, of photosynthesis that I want to talk about before I get into the specifics of our work and um, our colleagues' work. Uh, and that's that photosynthesis in terms of this on the cellular level is about more than just photosystem one and photosystem two and the way they move with these charges. There's this enormous diversity of chemistries that happen downstream of photosynthesis. And this links in with Professor Nasera's work as well in that we're really interested just as much in all of this rich diversity of downstream chemistry that you get from out of photosynthesis as we are in the charge transfer within the system as well. So by creating these three energy sources, NADPH, reduced ferredoxin, and ATP, the cell can then do an enormous diversity of chemistry. So you have reductive chemistry and dehydrogenases, oxidoreductases, and so on. You have all of the biosynthesis that goes on within the cell is linked to these energy carriers. Uh, nitrogen and sulfur assimilation, and then redox metabolism and carbon metabolism all rely on these energy carriers produced by photosynthesis. And really the point that I, I want to bring out here is that in artificial systems, often you're talking about linking water oxidation to a single fuel product, hydrogen or an alcohol, some fuel product that we're going to use within our energy infrastructure. But the cellular photosynthesis creates energy carriers that can do an enormous range of chemistries. And that provides a flexibility that would be 
really great to be able to reproduce in artificial systems. And that brings me again to biohybrid systems. Uh, so the first, very briefly, I'm going to talk about some of the work uh, looking at how you can link up PS1 to uh, catalysis to make biohybrids and study PS1. Uh, so this is just two examples. There are others. But uh, the Goldbeck group at Penn State, they were able to wire photosystem one to uh, artificial, to catalysts. So they've, in here, they're showing an, a nanocrystal, but you've also had, uh, they've also been able to link this to enzymes and to catalysts uh, and do some really fundamental work looking at the, how fast electrons can move through photosynthesis and what kind of uh, catalysis you can drive by directly linking that. Um, and then, uh, a group at Argonne National Laboratory did a similar work, but instead of using a molecular wire to connect a catalyst to photosynthesis, to photosystem one, uh, they absorbed a platinum nanoparticle, and they've since continued this work using other catalysts as well um, to drive light-driven catalysis. Um, and this has really allowed some fundamental work on uh, looking at the spectroscopy within PS1 and understanding how charges move uh, between those uh, energy sources. So uh, that's some primers on some simple ways you can use uh, natural systems in biohybrids. Now I'm going to move into the work in our lab, um, which is much more focused on this side of things, looking at the downstream chemistry that can happen using the high energy electrons. And to do that, we've replaced photosystem one with an artificial system to generate high energy electrons. Um, and I'm going to start off with quite a bit on our work on hydrogenases. And then later in the talk, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other work that we're doing. So the system that we use is semiconductor nanoparticle enzyme bio. Uh, and what this is, is linking the charge transfer and charge generation light capture pro properties of nanocrystals to redox enzymes. Uh, so as in photosystem one and photosystem two, when you excite a semiconductor nanoparticle, you, you promote an electron to the conduction band from the valence band, and you then have this high energy electron, which can be transferred out of the nanoparticle to species in solution. Uh, and in the case of our work, those species are enzymes. So we can transfer this electron into an enzyme, um, and these enzymes have their own internal charge transfer networks, uh, and that allows us to drive catalysis uh, with light. Um, and then the hole that remains behind, we use a chemical donor to regenerate. That regenerates the system and allows us to do this again. So the first question you might ask is, how are we forming these biohybrids and uh, getting stable structures? And we do that by mimicking the biological electron donors. So uh, shown here is uh, the hydrogenase that we're working with and its typical cellular redox partner, which is ferredoxin. And these are electrostatic maps of the enzyme. And in red is negatively charged, and in blue is positively charged. And you can see there's this match between the negatively charged ferredoxin and the positive patch on the enzyme, which allows ferredoxin to deliver electrons into these iron sulfur clusters, which dr can drive catalysis. So to mimic this, we use negatively charged nanomaterials, which have uh, ligands on the surface, which create a highly high density negative charge, which then absorbs to these positive patches in the same orientation that ferredoxin binds and allows us access to these iron sulfur clusters and promotes uh, electron transfer that results in catalysis. Um, and we've done a number of biochemical studies looking at how these nanoparticles can block ferredoxin binding to confirm that in fact we're binding at this site. And so if you bind a nanoparticle, if you add nanoparticles to a solution of enzyme and then try and drive the catalysis with ferredoxin, you don't get any uh, ferredoxin driven catalysis. So we're fairly certain that we are mimicking this biological um, electron transfer step and binding the nanoparticle at that site of biological electron injection. And then this is just a cartoon of um, how we envision the whole system. So we have a, a nanoparticle bound to the enzyme and you get electron transfer through all of these iron sulfur clusters to the active site, which then drives catalysis. Uh, so the next question you might ask is, does it actually work? Can we actually drive catalysis with light? And the answer is uh, conveniently yes. Um, so here is a grass chromatogram of the product formation. So this is measuring hydrogen in the headspace of a reaction vessel. 
Uh, so we have a, a small uptake as the machine is sampling the headspace. And then when we turn the light on, you can see we get this linear production of hydrogen. We turn the light off again, it goes flat, and then you get hydrogen production again. So we can, in fact, drive hydrogen production fairly efficiently using these biohybrids. So the question then becomes, all right, so we can make this work. What are we going to do with this? And the question I get asked frequently uh, is, you know, could we turn these into devices? And generally, the answer is probably not, because uh, one thing to note is that these hydrogenases are not simple to make. It's quite a labor intensive process. Um, and they're also quite oxygen sensitive. So what we really envision these biohybrids for is they are wonderful tools for understanding the fundamental mechanisms of photocatalysis, electron transfer, and uh, enzyme mechanism that really allow us to ask some interesting and fundamental questions about what's going on. And I'm going to give you some examples of the kind of work that we've been doing in that area. So first, we've been able to use these systems uh, in conjunction with our collaborators at uh, University of Colorado, uh, Gordana Dukovic's group, uh, to look at quantifying the electron transfer kinetics. So the efficiency of these systems is going to depend in large part on how well we can get the electron from the nanoparticle into the enzyme. Uh, and we can study this using ultrafast transient absorption spectroscopy. So I'm not, I'm not going to go over the details of this, but essentially when you excite an electron into this conduction band, it can either be transferred to the enzyme or it can recombine and re reform the ground state of the, uh, of the system. And we can look at the kinetics of those different processes, how much recombination occurs, how much electron transfer occurs, by looking at the nanoscale, nanosecond scale time resolved uh, spectra of the nanoparticles. And What's shown here is the, that those kinetics as we increase the amount of enzyme presence. So you can see as we increase the enzyme, the decay of this curve gets faster and faster, meaning the electron is being transferred faster and faster. And um, uh, Gordana Dukovic's group has done an enormous amount of modeling to understand this data on a really detailed way. Um, and our collaboration has generated a lot of really interesting information about the overall efficiency of photocatalysis and how these internal processes of recombination and electron transfer can drive the efficiency of photocatalysis and the um, overall product formation. Um, and this provides useful information for how to engineer artificial systems and you know, the kind of catalysis you're going to want, the kind of catalyst you're going to want in an artificial system. And, what properties of a light absorber you want in order to maximize this electron transfer versus this recombination, because these competing reactions are present in any system, artificial or natural. And um, we've been able to tease out some fundamental uh, insights into how to engineer these systems to opt optimize cat catalytic rates. Um, so another advantage of these biohybrids is they give us some unique tools to play with the system and drive catalysis. Um, and one of those is the ability to modulate the uh, size of the nanoparticle to change the potential of the electron. So the potential of the conduction band is dependent on the size of the nanoparticle. And as you get larger, the energy of the electron uh, goes down. And why is this interesting for us? Well, biology in general operates within a very narrow potential window. Uh, essentially, you have the potential of ferredoxin, you have the potential of NADPH, you have the potential of NADH. And there's some, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but the vast majority of enzymes operate within this very narrow potential window. Uh, and that is in stark contrast to a large number of uh, synthetic catalysts, which require much higher driving forces because they don't have the advantage of the enzyme 3D structure to reduce the energy of intermediates, and flatten out the potential landscape. Uh, and what biohybrids can allow us to do is ask some fundamental questions about how those uh, that enzymes operate within that narrow potential window. Uh, and this work, as an example, we were able to use four different sizes of nanomaterials with four different potentials, um, which if you think about the Marcus uh, electron potential, 
uh, calculations where elect the rate of electron transfer is going to depend on the potential difference between the donor and the acceptor, the distance and the, um, and the coupling constant, uh, you expect the rate of electron transfer to decrease as you decrease the potential of the electron. And what we found in the case of our biohybrids is that in fact all four sizes and all four potentials had essentially the same uh, electron transfer rate. And this is because of the tuning within the enzyme. So we were actually able to make some um, novel insights into how the enzyme flattens that potential and allows it to take electrons of dis different potentials and transfer them into the enzyme at essentially the same rate. Um, and that provides, again, some design principles for how you would want to design an enzyme to allow you to use uh, lower energy electrons. This also has the advantage of uh, if you look at the spectrum of these nanoparticles, larger nanoparticles absorb much more of the visible spectrum, which this covers roughly uh, 300 to 800 nanometers. So if you can tune catalysts to allow you to have fast electron transfer, even with low energy, low potential electrons, you can actually use more of the solar spectrum, which will give you more efficient artificial systems. Um, so we've also been able to use these systems to uh, investigate the mechanism of enzyme active sites. So again, this is our cartoon of uh, a nanoparticle enzyme biohybrid. Um, and this is a rendering of the active site of hydrogenase. And this active site serves as a model for uh, hydrogen catalysts because the, this enzyme can catalyze hydrogen production very quickly and very efficiently. Um, but there's still quite a few mechanistic questions about how this reaction works and how the enzyme modulates the intermediates. And one of the things that uh, biohybrids has allowed us to do is have time resolved spectroscopy of the active site changes. So uh, this plot here is a three dimensional plot of uh, time and wavelength showing the changes in the active site. And I'm not gonna get into the details of the um, infrared spectroscopy and, and what signal goes with what in the uh, active site. But what I want you to note is that we're seeing real time changes when we turn on the light and we're able to actually track the kinetics of individual species of this active site. The other advantage of these biohybrids is in contrast to how you typically do these kind of experiments of studying uh, the redox state of an enzyme, usually you will take uh, the system and you will poise it in the reduced state or poise it in the oxidized state chemically. Um, so that's, you, you can't watch it change. Uh, but what we can also do with biohybrids is because this electron transfer is not relying on diffusion, we can actually lower the temperature and still be able to inject electrons in. And that means we can slow down these catalytic processes and watch catalysis, uh, which can still go on at low temperatures if you can deliver an electron and actually tease out a few more details by being able to do them at low temperatures, which is a unique capacity of these biohybrids that we're, we're able to do. Um, so I've told you a very brief overview of a lot of the work that we've done with hydrogenases. Now I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the work we've done uh, looking at NADPH and linking it to some of the reductive chemistry that can happen in cells. Um, so what we were able to do is take ferrodox and NADP reductase, which has again been shown on all of those uh, photosynthesis uh, pictures, as the final step in electron transfer um, and replace ferrodoxin with this nanoparticle uh, to drive electron transfer into the flavin active site and reduce NAD plus to NADPH. Um, so here you can see this is a, a photo, uh, a fluorescence uh, signal of NADPH. It's accumulating. You can see we can accumulate, the longer we illuminate, the more NADPH we can accumulate. Um, and we were then able to take this uh, system and put it into uh, a solution with an alcohol dehydrogenase and actually generate a fuel product, in this case isobutanol, from isobutyraldehyde, recycling NADPH. And we were able to show that not only do we produce NADPH from illumination, but that we were actually able to drive this cycle uh, repeatedly and, and regenerate NADPH, have it used again, and then regenerate it. Um, and showing that you can couple biohybrids to biofuels production uh, situations and really mimic some of the downstream 
uh, properties of photosynthesis and advantages of photosynthesis. So finally, I want to finish up telling you about our work with nitrogen reduction. So um, we have we spent a great deal of time and effort, along with our collaborator, um, to understand the um, enzyme nanoparticle hydrogenase system and really get some mechanistic insights. So our, our next challenge was to say, what would happen if we tried to use this same kind of model system in a much more challenging multi-electron reaction? And in this case, uh, we focused on nitrogen reduction. Uh, so industrial nitrogen fixation is a really essential product, uh, process. There have been estimates that half the people alive on Earth today are the result of, are able to be alive because of the Haber-Bosch process, which takes um, nitrogen in the air and reduces it to ammonia, which is then used in fertilizer. So this is a very energy intensive process. It has to be done at very high temperatures and pressures in order to crack that very stable nitrogen triple bond. Um, and it's been estimated that it uses up to 1% of global energy use. So I said half, it's estimated that half the people uh, are able to be alive because of the Haber-Bosch process. So what about the other half? That comes from biological nitrogen fixation. So if you've ever heard that certain plants can enrich nitrogen in soils if they're planted after other crops, it's not actually those plants, it's the bacteria in their root nodules which are able to do biological nitrogen fixation and produce am ammonia naturally in the ground. Um, and in contrast to the Haber-Bosch process, that biological nitrogen fixation can happen at ambient conditions, meaning room temperature, room uh, pressure, no need to uh, concentrate the nitrogen uh, and put it at a high pressure. Um, but the cost of this is that it's got a very high biological demand, energy demand. So in addition to the need for eight electrons to crack an N2 molecule, you also need 16 ATP molecules. So this is, for a cell, this is an enormously uh, energy uh, intensive process. And these ATP are essential for driving electron transfer into the nitrogenase that actually does the chemistry of reducing nitrogen to ammonia. So our question was, could we make a biohybrid that replaces all of this energy intensive side of things uh, with a photocatalytic light driven process? Um, and the short answer is we were successful in doing this. Um, we were able to couple a, a nanorod to nitrogenase and drive nitrogen reduction. Um, we were able to achieve about 70% of the maximum rate for this protein, this MOFI protein. Um, and essentially, uh, one essential point is that we were able to show that this chemistry was actually happening at the iron molybdenum active site of nitrogenase by showing that the classic inhibitors that are known to stop this process in the enzyme uh, still in inhibited the process. So we were able to show that this was actually occurring at the active site of the nitrogen. So just briefly, I'd like to show you some of the ongoing work we're doing in our lab. Uh, so one essential element of nitrogen, nitrogenase activity is that in addition to producing ammonia, you also produce uh, hydrogen and it's actually essential to the mechanism of the enzyme. But the amount of hydrogen that you produce depends on the reaction conditions. And you can, under certain conditions, you can get more hydrogen and less ammonia produced, which reduces the efficiency. So obviously this is very important for um, understanding our photocatalytic system. And we're not currently, um, we're still building a picture of how that works. But we've been able to do some work showing that the light intensity that we use, i.e. the number of photons hitting the system within a given amount of time actually affects the nitrogen, um, uh, the amount of ammonia and the amount of hydrogen made. Um, and we measure this using N15 labeled uh, gas so that we're getting very accurate measures of the amount of ammonia being made. Um, and we have some results showing that as you increase the intensity of the light, you get more ammonia and less hydrogen, meaning that you're more efficiently driving electrons into ammonia production versus uh, hydrogen production, which is increasing the efficiency of the system overall. Um, and then we're also doing work on a reaction mechanism. So you can see this is quite a complicated proposed mechanism. There's a lot of individual steps. Uh, and we're using these biohybrids to look at 
the accumulation of these intermediates as each electron transfer occurs. Uh, and just briefly, we're, we've been able to show uh, spectroscopic evidence of moving through these uh, different states, and you can see changes in the spectra, new peaks coming in, the main peaks uh, are, are, are getting shorter, um, and we're able to un make some mechanistic insights into what's happening in this uh, reaction mechanism as we shine light on the system and move it through these different states. Uh, so I'd just like to finish up by giving you a brief overview of some of our colleagues and the amazing work that they're doing in biohybrids. Uh, so Brian Dyer's group at Emory University, they use um, time-resolved infrared spectroscopy, and they're actually using a mediated system where they can reduce a hydrogenase using a mediator generated at the nanoparticle. And they're able to make mechanistic insights, and they've built these very beautiful maps of how uh, uh, hydrogenase moves through different states using biohybrids. Um, so uh, the Reisner group at Cambridge, um, they work uh, also with nanoparticle biohybrids, and they've been able to link these uh, nanoparticles to CO2 reducing enzymes and make formate from CO2 and study some of the processes involved. Um, our collaborator, Gerdana Dukovic, uh, has this very recent, in the last couple of weeks, published this lovely paper um, where they were showing carbon-carbon bond formation they were able to drive carbon-carbon bond formation um, from CO2 using a nanoparticle enzyme um, hybrid. Uh, and then finally, uh, a little bit different, more like the first set of work I showed, um, using Photosystem 2, uh, several groups have been able to link Photosystem 2s to uh, catalysts to drive catalysis. Um, and then at our National Laboratory, Lisa Utzig's group, um, actually was able to take their earlier work on just PS1 and uh, place it within the context of the entire thylakoid membrane uh, and drive catalysis and, uh, linked to water splitting within this thylakoid membrane. Uh, and finally, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the people who contributed to this work. Uh, the Redox Biochemistry Group at, at, at NREL, uh, Paul King is our group leader and the PI of these projects, uh, David, Kara, uh, along with myself, our co-PIs on these projects. Um, Mike was a scientist with our group who left us to join the Peace Corps, um, and he did a lot of the um, IR studies that we shed, and then Bryant Chicka is currently a postdoc in our group working on the nitrogenous. Uh, we also have uh, a number of wonderful collaborators. Gordana Dukovic has worked with our group almost from the start on all of our hydrogenase work. Um, the nitrogenase group uh, is a large group, including our group, um, the Dukovic group and Lance Seafelt at Utah State and John Peters at Washington State. Um, and then we also uh, collaborate with Alex Gow at Carnegie Mellon on spectroscopy. And then we have a number of wonderful collaborators at NREL who, who've worked on these projects at various points. And then most importantly, um, I'd like to say none of this work would have happened without the support of the DOE Office of Science, Basic Energy Sciences. Um, the hydrogenase work was supported by photosynthesis Aesthetic systems and solar photochemistry, and uh, our nitrogenase work is supported by physical biosciences and solar photochemistry together. Um, and none of this would be possible without their support. Um, and thank you all for attending this lecture. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to um, Dr. Uh, Nasera. Uh, and just a reminder to our audience to please remember to type in your questions in the in the chat feature so that we can have a, a vibrant discussion at the close of Dr. Nasera's uh, presentation. So I'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Nasera. Hello, hello. Hi, you're on. Yeah, I said, can you, could you see my presentation? Oh, no, we cannot. Okay. Hila, I need you to find my presentation. Just wait one second. Share, I guess. Yeah, this will be interesting to find your presentation. It's on the desktop. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah, so okay. how do I do that? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Share. Yes, but first we need to see it here. So let me just 
Just wait one sec. That's why I wanted that we each show. There it is. No, go down to share. I'm having a little problem. Did you close this? Yeah, I did. And now I did. I closed it by accident. Would you like me to pull up your slides from my end? Can you just hit this thing and get back to the maybe? Do I get back to the program? Now it's open. Now yeah, hit it. Now go down the share. Okay, I got it. Can you see it? We can, yes, thank you. Okay, so I'll talk about artificial photosynthesis sort of the way we just brought up. Um, and what I'm gonna show is using just sunlight, air, and water. You can almost make anything and actually greatly exceed photosynthesis. Uh, I'm going to talk about photosynthesis more in a, in, an, in a systems engineering way. And that is, and this is what I, I think was Kate did a really great job explaining this, but my field forgets this, that when you do photosynthesis, the plant only uses sunlight to split water to hydrogen and oxygen. That's it. It then takes, in, in that means the energy of the sunlight is in the rearranged bonds of water to basically make fuels, oxygen and hydrogen in nature's form of hydrogen, NADPH. It then takes that hydrogen and in the dark, the so-called calcium benson or dark cycle combines it with carbon dioxide to make biomass. And so what I want you to concentrate on, at least for the talk that I'm giving, is sunlight is used to split water, hydrogen and oxygen. All the biomass you think about, whether it's polymers or wood or sugar, you name it, that's not energy storage. That's just simply a form of hydrogen storage. That's what, how nature said, I can't deal with H2 as a gas. And so what I'll do is store hydrogen with carbon dioxide in the form of biomass. And so water splitting is energy storing, biomass is hydrogen storing. And the reason for that simple thermodynamics, water splitting is 1.23 volts uphill. So that's how you store the energy of sun light. Once I have the hydrogen, and I'm showing five products here, I could show thousands, literally millions of products. And CO2 plus hydrogen, and in this instance, I've split my hydrogen up. So this is three moles of hydrogen in the first reaction, four, nine, 12, 15 moles of hydrogen. Once I have hydrogen combined with carbon dioxide, it's thermoneutral or, or downhill. So we took that lesson from photosynthesis and said, we're gonna do a two-step process First, we'll figure out how to use sunlight to split water to hydrogen and oxygen. Then, in the dark, we'll figure out some way to then take the hydrogen with CO2 and make biomass. And that's basically the inorganic biological hybrid approach. The inorganic materials chemistry, catalysis, that's on the light side, the one I'm about to talk to. And then the biology, that then needs to get interfaced to the biology, which then will run the dark reaction, which is H2 fixation with CO2 to make biomass. I'm not going to go into this. We published, these are well-known catalysts, and I published them eight years ago. In the last four years, actually, really spent a lot of time thinking about mechanisms. But the bottom line is, 
we invented, this is just one of these catalysts, it's a cobalt phosphate catalyst, it's inorganic. When it gets, it gets charge on it, so initially we just plugged it into the wall and took electricity out of the wall. It splits water to oxygen. It leaves four protons are left behind. And then we made two catalysts. These are two shown here, a nickel molybdenum zinc alloy or a cobalt phosphorus alloy that could then take the electrons and protons and make hydrogen. Uh, there's two important things about this catalyst. One is these catalyst sets. One is there's no sun. So I got to figure out how to get sunlight into them. But another thing which we spent a lot of time doing, these are the first self-healing catalysts, meaning as long as these catalysts are operating, they never die. And we, with DOE support, have figured out a lot about how to generate self-healing catalysts, but they never die as long as they're doing catalysts. And this, the bottom line is they self-assemble and the energy for self-assembly is less than the energy for catalysis. So as long as they have enough energy to do catalysis, they always have enough energy to self-assemble. So if the catalyst degrades, it has enough energy to reform itself. And a simpler way to say this is, as long as these catalysts are operating, a self-healing catalyst has a turnover number of infinity. It can never die. Why did we spend so much time making self-healing catalysts? One is we can use literally any water source. So we can run this out of pure water, which is how most water splitting catalysts operate. We can run it out of a puddle on the ground. We can run it out of the Charles River. We can run it out of seawater. We can run it out of urine. And a lot of this, this science was, is dedicated to getting energy to the poor. And if I'm going to get, if I'm going to do something for the poor, I can't say I need 18 mega ohm pure water or concentrated base to do water splitting. So that was important to us. But for the purposes of this talk, when you're in neutral water, it's easy to stabilize materials. And so remember, I don't have any light in the picture yet. So I'm going to have to interface these catalysts to light absorbing materials. And then if I'm in neutral water and buffered waters, that allows me to interface the biology. So the key to this whole front end was self-healing catalysis. To interface the materials, just here's the first sort of uh, path we took. And this is using a triple junction silicon cell, that inner wafer of silicon, there's three layers. That's engineered, we, we took amorphous silicon, that absorbs at 400 nanometers. And then we introduced germanium into the strained amorphous silicon lattice, that changes the absorption spectrum. The, the more germanium you dope into amorphous silicon, the red shifted you can go. So we dope enough germanium to get that middle spectrum shown here. And then we dope even more germanium in and get the bottom spectrum. And we engineered the germanium such that that three wafer system absorbs top, middle, bottom. And that spectrum absorbs the total visible absorption spectrum of solar light. You then have to protect the silicon. And we did that with ITO initially. Now we use FTO. You put the catalyst on top, the water splitting oxygen catalyst. You put the hydrogen catalyst on the bottom. When sunlight goes into the system, you get one unit of charge separation. Just like in photosynthesis, you need four units of charge. When you charge up the top catalyst with four holes, it makes oxygen. When you charge up the bottom catalyst with four electrons, it makes hydrogen from the leftover protons from the water splitting above. So the key here, so this is called a Berry Junction. It was the first Berry Junction. It's totally wireless. It's only coatings. The beauty of this is it's modular. You can replace the inner absorber with any absorber you would like. You can use different catalysts on top and bottom. 
Uh, so it's a modular design. There's a, there's a lot more work to be done in this area for people who are interested. You could use organic photovoltaics. You could use perovskites. That's something I want to do with NREL. Um, you can use different catalysts. But the key here is the solar piece of photosynthesis we can greatly exceed. Our soul, this version of using the cobalt catalyst with the nickel catalyst, Cassandra, who's now working at BASF, she achieved solar to hydrogen efficiencies of 12.8%. So that's a true efficiency. We take energy of sunlight in. We look and see how much hydrogen we made. We know how much energy is in the hydrogen we made. And you just divide one by the other and you get a true efficiency. And that's 12.8%. So what that means is on the light side of the reaction, which I now have darkened out, we have a very high solar to hydrogen energy conversion efficiency. We then said, how do we take that hydrogen, combine it with carbon dioxide? And we went back to photosynthesis. And this is what you just heard. You heard the whole photosynthetic chain so photosystem two splits water to oxygen. There's electron transfer relays in between that send the electrons over to PS1. And then there are catalysts there to make hydrogen. And like I said, nature stores hydrogen as NADPH. What I just told you is I can replace that entire part of the photosynthetic membrane, just get rid of it, because I can now use sunlight to split water to make hydrogen at very high efficiencies using sunlight. What I can't get rid of, however, is how do I take the hydrogen and then somehow get it to combine with CO2? So there's a large field trying to do this chemically. We said we'll hijack biology and now interface the inorganic water splitting to a biological organism and where I need to enter then is at NADPH. So I need to convert my hydrogen to NADPH. Once I have NADPH, I can drive an ATPase. This is John Walker's Nobel Prize. And once I have NADPH and ATP, I can drive CO2 fixation. And so that's here, we'll take hydrogen. Somehow I need to get it into a bioorganism that breeds in carbon dioxide, and then I'll hijack biology. So here's a schematic. I'm going to take photosystem one and two in the membrane, get rid of it, because I have water splitting with very junctions. But now how do I get hydrogen into an organism? And the easy way to do that is to use a hydrogenase. And so hydrogenase enzymes, you just heard about them, they take H2 to two protons and two electrons. Once I have two protons and two electrons, I can back end it to an NADPH reductase. Once I have that, I can basically follow the biological pathway with ATP synthase. And NADPH and ATP, I can run carbon fixing cycles. So that's what we did. We took bacteria, Ralstonia eutropha. You can overexpress if you would like hydrogenetically, you can put hydrogenases in the membrane. And once you do that, it enables you to wire inorganic chemistry to biology. So we did that. There's different ways you can do it. You can use the artificial leaf directly. You can use a photo a voltaic and then wire up your catalyst. They make the hydrogen and the bugs eat the hydrogen directly. The important point here is the only food source for this bacteria is hydrogen. Because of the way they're designed now, they can't eat anything else. So if they don't have hydrogen, they go dormant and die. If they have hydrogen, they can live. And just like any bioorganism, they can two go to four, four go to eight, and you can go into an exponential growth cycle. So you take a pinch of bugs, these Ralstonia eutropha, you load them up with their hydrogenases, and then you start feeding them hydrogen, and they grow, and you grow biomass. 
and it's all in the form of lipids. Most of the bug is mostly lipid and you can grow a lot of biomass. One of the students who did this is Chan Lu, and I believe he's actually participating in this uh, seminar series. So the other thing Chan did is he said, once I'm at acetyl coenzyme A, I could take the Ralstonia eutrophic and you can add different genes and these genes deliver different enzymes in the cell. And just like you heard, the enzymes can carry out chemistry. So we put these four genes in the cell. One makes a ketovialase, one makes a transferase, a decarboxylase and a dehydrogenase. And we chose those four genes because they do this chemistry. So a ketobiolase cuts the acetyl coenzyme carbon bond and makes a carbon-carbon bond. The transferase hydro hydrolyzes it. The decarboxylase you decarboxylate CO2, and then you hydrogenate. And so if you have this Ralstonia eutrophic with its hydrogenases and then these four genes, it makes isopropanol. You can do different biosynthetic pathways, and we did. And you can make, that's the C3 I just told you about. You can make C4 and C5s. We've made, this isn't published yet. I can make C8s, so I can make gasolines. If I start with propionyl coenzyme A, there's three carbons. I add two carbons at a time. You can make C11s and 13s. You can make diesels. So, you can engineer, and this is just using the tools of synthetic biology, I can in engineer different biosynthetic pathways. I want to come back here, and this is important, and talk about efficiency, because the literature is a bit of a mess. There's lots of papers in science and nature, people taking nanowires and putting bugs on them, and there's a bunch of biohybrid stuff, and they talk about quantum yields and Faradayic efficiency, and they'll say it's 90 or 100 percent, and then you see the paper in Nature and Science. But that's not the whole story, and the reason I say that is that's not energy, a quantum yield, or a Faradayic efficiency. So Faradayic efficiencies is electrons into product made. That's not a true energy efficiency. If my electrons go in at 20 volts, which is most of these papers because they're keeping constant current, they let the voltage swing. And a typical potentiostat to maintain the voltage can put 20 or 30 volts. So if I'm putting electrons in, which is C, Faradayic efficiency, and I'm doing that at 30 volts versus 1.23, which is thermodynamic efficiency, then I take a hit of a factor of 30 in overall energy efficiency. So these are true energy efficiencies I'm talking about. We look to see how much hydrogen we made at a voltage, and that gives you an energy for that hydrogen, an electrical efficiency, because we take the energy of the electrons to make hydrogen, and then we divide it by the amount of material we made times the heat of formation. So that's energy of product over energy of electrons that make hydrogen. And in there is the solubility of hydrogen in everything. It's electrons to hydrogen. I know how much energy is there. And then I say, how much energy did I make in my product? That gives an electrical efficiency. If I use a 20% PV, I take the electrical efficiency times 0.2, and it gives me a true energy efficiency. So one thing this field needs to start doing is talking about true efficiencies, not just Faradayic efficiency or quantum yield. If you do that with the system I just told you for growing in biomass, we hit 10.8% with a 20% typical uh, PV driver. So that is well over natural photosynthesis. The best crops grow at 1%. So the biomass we're growing, these bugs are growing at 10.8%. You can make isopropanol at 8%. We're making C5s at 5% efficiency. So that's sunlight in the product made. This purple bar I want you to concentrate on now, this is a different type of biomass. That's polyhydroxybutyrate. So this biomass is in lipid, 
The red and blue bars are in a fuel. That's the energy we're counting. The polyhydroxybutyrate is a biopolymer that's stored inside the cell. And so, like I told you now, we've converted hydrogen to a solid biopolymer inside the cell. So that's the first part. This is an organism that fixes carbon and you can artificially greatly exceed natural photosynthesis. In my opinion now, nobody should be growing crops for biomass. They should be doing this. And then you can take your biomass and meet up with your favorite chem engineer and turn that into a biofuel. And now you can put a factor of 10 in front of all your calculations because most calculations use 1% soy or switchgrass. But as you heard in the last talk, another big hydrogen fixing need is nitrogen to make food. So what we did here is, and this is the trick of polyhydroxybutyrate, which I'm, in, I'm indicating with these white balls of plastic inside the organism. Now what we did is we took a carbon and nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so by doing that, I can take water splitting, fix it with CO2 to make a biopolymer, PHB. And then if the organism has nitrogenases in it, the nitrogenase can get its hydrogen from PHB, like I told you, biomass is for hydrogen. It can then also degrade the PHB to get energy, ATP, and I can drive a nitrogenase cycle. So this organism now is a different organism. It's a xanthobacteria. It's carbon and nitrogen fixing. And it's a three-step process. Split water to make hydrogen. Have bug, like I just showed you, take CO2 plus hydrogen and make PHB, solid biopolymer. And then you draw on the PHB to drive nitrogen fixation to make ammonia. And that is important because as you heard, nitrogenases to fix nitrogen, it's extremely energy intensive. So most natural organisms downregulate nitrogen fixation because it's so exhausting to the cell. But with this trick, I made my cells super energetic. They don't downregulate nitrogen production. And so the bottom line is after they fix water, they make the polyhydroxybutyrate, they draw on that and run nitrogen fixation. We prove it's all, all the nitrogen's coming from air. We use N15, like you saw in the last talk, and we see all the ammonia's N15 label. But the really incredible thing here is these bugs per cell are fixing, are having a turnover number of nitrogen of three times 10 to the nine. Because they're so energy rich, they don't downregulate nitrogen fixation. That's a lot of ammonia per cell. Remember, my cells don't need sunlight anymore. I preloaded them with sunlight in the form of PHB. I can put the bugs in the ground. They begin drawing on the PHB. They breathe in nitrogen, and I can grow crops. So here, what I'm showing you over here on the left with no biofertilizer, this is just out of fertile soil, we get radishes. But then I can put my bugs in the ground and I can get radishes and I'm getting increased crop yields of 150% because I now have a natural renewable fertilization method. The story is a little better than I'm telling you because the soil I grew these radishes, which are 1.5 times bigger than those, I didn't grow it out of fertile soil, the gray bars, I inoculated the soil, took all the nutrients out, and then the, put the bugs in the ground. Because what the bugs are doing are they're, re, they're renewably re-energizing the soil with carbon and nitrogen. One thing I didn't tell you about is if you put them against the natural waste stream, they will also fix phosphorus in the term of in terms of polyphosphate. So now I have a way to take phosphorus out of waste stream, take carbon and nitrogen out of air, all driven by sunlight, and renutrify soils. To end, I'm going to show you our latest crop. And I don't do chemistry anymore. I guess I become a farmer. 
So what I did here is this is a 400 acre farm that grows lettuce and corn. And I took bugs that were energized with PHB. They're a lean. I've only energized these bugs at five to eight percent. We now are up to 25 percent. So I can get rid of and this. Is, let me just do this experiment. I took synthetic fertilizer. It's called UAN, urea ammonium nitrate. For growing corn, typical corn per acre, you use 130 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So nitrogen per pound of UAN. I replace half of the fertilizer with my bugs and I get the same crop yields. And so that's important because remember, that means I'm not not fixing nitrogen with methane. That's how you do Harbor Bosch. So I save that CO2. And then after the bug degrades the PHB, takes the hydrogen out of the polymer, it leaves carbon in the ground. So first I'm carbon neutral. I'm using hydrogen, not from methane. I'm saving that CO2. And I'm carbon negative because the PHB, which remember is, grown, is being fixed at 10 times times natural photosynthesis, meaning 10 times the rate of natural photosynthesis I'm putting in a cell. After the cell degrades the PHB, it leaves the carbon in the ground and it sequesters it. So this is true data from my farm trial. For that corn farm trial, I saved by replacing half the fertilizer, I saved 109,000 pounds of carbon dioxide from going into the air. And after I degrade the PHB, I, I knew how much PHB is in the cells I put in the ground. I end up sequestering, I pull or suck 16,000 pounds of carbon into the ground. So um, that's for a 400 acre farm trial for growing corn, it would use 26,000 pounds of nitrogen I've saved. And that's what the carbon footprint is. So the important point here is if you start combining fat growing agriculture, the way I'm talking about using a biohybrid approach, with water splitting, which is how you get the solar light into the system, you can be carbon neutral in fuels and you're actually carbon negative. And this is a way to do massive carbon fixation, I believe. Uh, and you can grow crops with beneficial yields. We're very happy about this because this is, means I can do both Fisher tropes and Harbor Bosch in a distributed way using only sunlight, air, and any water source. And that's how I believe the future needs to be, especially for the poor parts of the world. To end, I just want to tell you this approach is totally general. Synthetic biology is growing by leaps and bounds. So not only do you have to make fertilizer and fuels, you can make polymers, plastics, you can make drugs, you can make starches. There are seven out of the 10 drugs on the market are biological now. I've been invited by three, the CEOs of the three top pharma companies. They are now realizing this is a way they can renewably make drugs by interfacing solar water splitting via hydrogenases into their organisms. So this guy went to Harvard for only one year and I heard he was stuck on Mars. So in, when you're going to Mars, you have sunlight, you have urine, and you have CO2. You could literally start thinking about making things this way. And actually, NASA is interested in this. So that's it. Um, to end this, I have to tell you, I never fit into any program. So none of this was federally funded. Uh, it was done, and I owe a lot of gratitude to my friends, Tom Steyer and Kat Taylor. Uh, all this research was funded privately by them. And um, I hope now this method gains traction and the federal agencies will get interested in it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm done, Jessica. So, Jessica? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. This, yeah. is, Mark, this is Mark Jones. Okay. I'll, I'll step in. How are you guys? Th everybody can hear me? Good? Okay. So we have had some questions come in. Uh, please 
continue to type questions in the chat window if you have questions for Catherine or for Dan. And I'll, I'll try to get started here. Uh, there's a, I'll start with, with Catherine. There was a, you mentioned the quantum yield near 100% in photosystem one and things like 70% of maximum biological yield. Can, uh, there are a couple questions coming in about the, what the efficiencies mean here. Uh, when you define that, can you give a little more color to what that, what those efficiencies mean? Uh, sure. So uh, when we talk about quantum yield, what we usually mean is um, for every photon that's absorbed, how much product are you getting out? So in the case of hydrogen, for example, every molecule of hydrogen that we produce requires two electrons. So that's two photons. Uh, so if you were getting uh, 50 molecules of hydrogen for every 100 photons absorbed, you would have 100% quantum efficiency. In reality, you're limited by the electron transfer rate, the recombination rate of the nanoparticles. Um, so that's generally what I mean by quantum yield. Um, uh, to take uh, move up a level and talk about some of the efficiency of photosynthesis, um, it, that's actually a topic of ongoing debate that happens at NREL a lot because we have uh, you know, a, a great diversity of, of folks. So we have electrochemists and um, physical chemists who will tell you that uh, biology is extremely inefficient because photosynthesis is you know, usually 1% to 3% and some engineered crops you get about 7% efficiency, meaning every, for every photon absorbed, you're only getting 7% out electrons. But um, what I think, uh, what Professor Nacero's work shows, and, and I think if you look at it from a different perspective, um, biology is inefficient because it's not interested in giving us what we want. It's interested in staying alive and growing. Um, and so you have to look at quantum efficiency from a slightly different perspective, which I think, you know, Professor Nacera's talk showed very nicely that you can get around some of those challenges. But um, when you're talking about bi uh, efficiency on a biological scale, you need to think about the fact that um, these plants and animals are looking to stay alive and reproduce and uh, grow, not give us what we want. So it, efficiency depends on what perspective you're looking at. Yeah, can I, uh, could I Please. jump in? Yeah, it's um, the DOE organized the conference, uh, a little workshop actually, eight years ago now. It was run by Bob Blankenship. And he had physical chemists like me and Art Nozick in and lots of biologists and crop scientists. And just for the people listening in, a paper was published in Science in 2011-ish. Its number, uh, volume number was 332 and page number 805. And that paper is a consensus paper on photosynthetic efficiencies leading to crops. And it's exactly what Kate said. Biology didn't know it was supposed to grow up and be oil wells for us. So for two billion years of evolution, it had to go in a different direction. But if you want to find out what really is happening in an efficiency for both C3 and C4 products, that paper is pretty definitive. And uh, you know, people put a lot of time in it. And I, I think there's consensus in the community that that paper is accurate. And that's what people use for for plant growing efficiencies. Yeah, but, and, and if you want, to, if people who are on the line want to click, Jake Yeston has just typed that a link into the chat window so that you can click on Dan's work and get to Dan's work immediately. That's not my work, it's a group of work, but it's that paper. But I do want to say you can get around it just like was mentioned by Catherine. And, and, and biology didn't know what was supposed to solve our world's problems by growing plants two billion years. Um, so, do you have a couple questions coming in? I'll start with you, Dan. W where do you draw the line? What are the efficiencies that are needed to make biohybrids actually industrially competitive with fossil fuels okay. or for fertilizer? All right. So, the fossil fuel thing, there is nothing any human being is ever going to do that's going to displace fossil fuels when you can poke a hole in the ground, take them out of the ground. That's over 90 years of infrastructure that's all paid off, you will never, ever, ever be competitive unless you do carbon pricing. So anybody who thinks they're going to be competitive commercially making fuels versus putting holes in the ground, 
in a paid off infrastructure with no price on carbon, um, you will have all failed futures. It, it's just no way to be competitive. So that's why I didn't try to commercialize the carbon piece. Someday, if you price carbon, this isn't, you, you can make fuels this way, but you're gonna need incentives with carbon pricing. On the fertilizer piece, it's already, it's already competitive. This is what I'm talking about is already getting commercialized and there are countries all over the world now interested in this. It's an interest, I know there's some USDA people on the line. This is an interesting fertilizer because by definition it's non-chemical. I never put nitrogen in the ground. I put some carbon in the ground. I put some phosphorus in the ground. But from a nitrogen point of view, this is a non a non-nitrogen fertilizer, when it goes in the ground, it starts making nitrogen from the air. So this is kind of an interesting approach to think about fertilization. The cost targets are already competitive. I'll just leave it at that. Again, sticking with you for a moment, it, you only replaced half in the data that you showed. Is there a, can you explain the reason why you didn't, can't completely replace with your your engineer yeah. organism? Yeah. So one is I told you I made a lean, a lean bug. It was only 8% loaded with PHB. When it finally runs out of its own internal energy supply, it starts down regulating because it says now I'm going to get exhausted and die. Um, if we go to 25%, which we can do now, I can go all, all the way down to a replacement of 90%. I still need 10% because the bugs need to get kick-started. And when you first, this gets into growing crops, like I told you, I'm slowly becoming a farmer and learning all this. Um, you need immediate nitrogen in the form of nitrate. So we need a kick-start with a little bit of nitrate, but when they're super fat, I can replace up to 90% of the chemical fertilizer. Uh, that's important because EPA is starting in their regulations in California right now, looking for to already, can, is there a way to replace 50%? And finally, in, in e, that's on the books, I believe, some legislations in the work because of harmful algal blooms. And we're already at 50. I think we can top out at 90 with a kickstart of nitrate. At the end of the day, I can probably get rid of the nitrate because I can formulate some nitrate fixing bacteria that make nitrate quickly and eat the ammonia from my bug and make nitrate. But I should say, this is a big step down the road in terms of EPA initiatives of getting rid of harmful algal blooms. But it literally comes down to how much loaded they are with their energy before they begin down regulating. Okay, thank you. Uh, so so tr returning to Catherine for a moment, um, in the, uh, if we are talking about the efficiencies, which you've spoken about in your review paper, what, what is currently the upper, reasonable upper bound that you think these systems can get to and, and what's limiting you? What's your wish list for what you could figure out that you don't know today? All right, well, so for our systems, um, what we found is that uh, a major limitation is actually uh, the recombination rate of the nanomaterial. Uh, so that's, and again, this, provides a, a nice contrast to photosynthesis because uh, both PS1 and PS2, they move those charges very rapidly away from the, the central chromophore so that they can't recombine, uh, which makes the system much more efficient. Uh, in the biohybrids that we work with, um, you have an inherent recombination rate within that nanoparticle, um, and that competes with electron transfer into the enzymes. Um, and so the longer you can make that excited state last by engineering nanomaterials, the more chance, essentially it's a probability argument, the, the longer it, it hangs around, the more chance you have to transfer it out into the enzyme. So that's uh, one of the major limitations for <clears throat> biohybrid systems, the kind of biohybrids that we work with. Um, and again, we're really focused on those fundamental principles of, of how to engineer the systems to be more efficient. Uh, so really, it's it's that rapid charge separation and creating long-lived states. That's that's the key. Uh, 
based on the questions that are coming in, I think that Dan is onto something talking about food. Seems everybody is thinking with their stomach a little bit here. So I'm going to return to you, Dan. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of confusion around exactly how you use your, you've created an organism that you photo illuminate so that it, it stores PHBs or PHAs in its, in its cellular structure. And then you introduce that into the soil. Is that correct? Yeah, I know people always get confused by this. That's why I said it's three steps. So first I need sunlight and I do water splitting. And that's just like I told you at the beginning with photosynthesis. I make hydrogen. So step one, I have sunlight. Step two, I don't need, once I make hydrogen, I can turn sunlight off because I've stored the sunlight in the rearranged bonds of water. Now, in the dark, the bug takes the hydrogen, which came from sunlight, that's where I stored the energy thermodynamically, and it breathes in carbon dioxide and it makes a solid fuel. So, it makes PHB, I've stored the sunlight in the biopolymer. And I can do that in the dark. I only need sunlight for water splitting. Then I do carbon fixation in the dark, make polyhydroxybutyrate. Once the bug has polyhydroxybutyrate, it still has all the energy. I still don't need sunlight. I can then put the bug in the ground where the sun doesn't shine, but it's been loaded up by a solar energy supply and it draws on that solar energy supply, PHB, to do nitrogen fixation. Because again, people forget nitrogen plus hydrogen and ATP, that's thermoneutral, basically. It's a little bit downhill. I don't need I only need the energy to drive the nitrogenase. And now it's from the PHB. So you only need sunlight for water splitting. And then we, we played the trick of storing the sunlight with carbon and then telling the bug draw on that stored hydrogen and internal energy supply and do nitrogenase. And that's why they can go in the ground and they don't need sunlight anymore. That also means that they don't then regenerate the PHBs. Is that that's, That's right. That's why I'm calling it a true fertilizer. When it runs out of PHB, the bugs start down regulating and they don't make any more ammonia. And so you have to put more bugs in the ground like you would with a fertilizer. This is an organic biofertilizer loaded up with PHB so they can start generating it. Once they're in the ground, they're, matter of fact, a lot of them die. When they finally run out of their PHB, this organism dies. There's a kill switch on it. Okay, so a question kind of for both of you. Uh, in, in the first presentation, we had a bunch of things that were nanorods with like cadmium in them and other things. You're now engineering, engineering an organism. Can you speak broadly about the safety of these bioinorganic systems as we are talking about releasing them or, or getting them out of the lab? Catherine, can we start with you? Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, I mean, I think there's, um, there's ongoing work with, um, you know, carbon-based quantum dots and, and non-toxic materials uh, that can be used. Um, there, uh, you know, the, the Reisner group, for example, uh, uses TiO2, which is not going to be toxic. So you're not necessarily wedded to uh, toxic materials. Um, the, the cadmium-based systems that we use, they're, they're really excellent for laboratory scale fundamental question basic science research where we're really asking questions about about how these things work without designs in mind. Um, but I think there are um, a, a lot of work in the material science realm making new materials that you could use that wouldn't be toxic in similar systems. But again, um, you know, the work that we do, it's really not focused on making design level uh, yeah. or device level uh, systems. It's really focused on um, fundamental understanding. And, and that requires, I think, a different approach than the kind of work that Professor Nassaro talks about, um, which is much more focused on, um, you know, end use. Um, and I think that they're just two different approaches that require slightly different focus and, and different choices of material. Thanks. So Dan, same question to you. What about the safety aspects? Okay, so making fuels, the bugs aren't released, just like anything. They're sitting in a, you can think of like a fermenter. They're eating hydrogen, so I'm splitting water. There's a 
photovoltaics, let's do this design. You can have a lot of different reactor designs. But I can have a photovoltaic, the leads go into two electrodes. Actually, we run these in PVC piping, and we just run the bugs over around in a loop, and they grow inside a reactor. So none of those are released into the environment. For the food, to make my future life easier, and probably the EPA and USDA, we didn't want to use a GMO. So what we did is, first we did synthetic biology, and there's three genes. It's called the five, A, B, and C genes. And we use those genes to have the bug fix carbon to make polyhydroxybutyrate. We then learned how the organism was doing that, the microbiology. So when I tell you, by the way, if, if I do the synthetic biology, I can fix over 90% by their weight with polyhydroxybutyrate. So when you look at the cell, it just looks like a big white blob almost. But for the bugs I'm putting in the ground that I just did these field trials, after we figured out how the bug was fixing the, micro, the, the carbon dioxide to make polyhydroxybutyrate, we were able to grow them naturally under certain microbiology growth conditions. And that's why we get up, the ones I'm telling you, we get up to 25% now. There's no genetic engineering. It's using this strange bug we have, this xanthobacteria, and then developing the microbiology, which we learned from the synthetic biology, and they do everything naturally, so there's no genetic engineering for those bugs that are in the ground. So, so also for you, Dan, you, you know, are somewhat famous for the artificial leaf. You're now dealing with microbes. Is there really, is there any potential that these same ideas could be used in something like a higher organism, a, a, a leafy plant, or is that out of the realm of even your thoughts? Um, it's out of the realm of my thoughts because coming in the front, I'm all about energy efficiency. <laughs> coming in the door, whenever I get tied to biology, they need to live. It's like Kate was saying, that whole step-down procedure that leads to the high quantum efficiency they're moving electrons down a potential ramp. That's why, so they're, they're quote unquote losing energy, but she's exactly right. They aren't losing energy. Every time the electron steps down, it's putting energy elsewhere because the thing needs to live and reproduce. My hydrogen production is dead. I don't need to work so I can collect all that energy. So I don't ever want to go into bi a natural organism because coming out of the blocks, I'm going to be limited by energy efficiency. And by using the hybrid approach, I've blown way by that limitation. So I haven't had a thought about trying to go into a natural organism yet. Now, you can use natural organisms that do other things, and then you just play my trick of using solar water splitting and making ATP and NADPH the way I told you, and then use those bioorganisms. So there's lots of possibilities that way. But I don't want to rely on natural photosynthetic energy efficiencies when they're stuck at 1% and just coming out of the blocks, I'm at 10 or 11%. And I can go higher. If I make hydrogen at a higher efficiency, I'm going to even have higher efficiency to, uh, photosynthesis. So you're somewhat using the same trick that cyanobacteria use to be able to live at night by, but many of those excrete extracellular. You're keeping all your material intracellular. Is there, is there a reason you couldn't also do extracellular such that you could then through the growing season add food, if you would, back onto the soil or even have the, have microbial degradation give you uh, the food that you need? Yeah, so look, I mean, look, if we're gonna go into advance, like in the future, why grow crops? I'll just have the bacteria to make start. Okay. <laughs> Good point. Like, that, that gets back to the, uh, you know, the, the Martian movie, like why grow a potato? I'll just have them emit the starch directly. And I'm serious about that. That's something we're looking at in our lab now, just making sugars and starches directly and just skip all growing in, in the ground. But, you are right, These, there's a big problem with cyanobacteria though, and 
and this gets down to also microalgae. For energy efficiency, every organism needs to catch photons. And so that's why when you look at reactor design or, de or designs of algae reactors, it gets complicated because if you don't absorb photons, you're wasting solar energy. And this approach gets around that. Like I showed you, you can engineer the inorganic part to do all the light absorption. And so you have much simpler reactor designs, which translates into lower cost up front. Um, but you are right, I could choose some other organism and have them excrete stuff. And like I said, the ones we're concentrating on now are sugars and starch directly. Okay. Um, again, another question that's just come in, uh, more for you, can you, ex you, you use the term self-healing and I've read several of your papers and it always kind of causes me to scratch my head on the, on your artificial leaf. Can you talk about the self-healing nature of the water splitting catalyst? Yeah. I mean, I've published a paper. I know these papers are pretty complicated. Um, I'm going to just explain it simply. There's a paper I published in PNAS. Again, a little complicated on the, the, the physical chemistry of self-healing. But this is, this is how I'll explain it. If I have cobalt in solution, cobalt 2 plus, and I have to put a potential on it to get to cobalt 3 plus, and then in the presence of phosphate, the catalyst forms spontaneously. It turns out for this catalyst, I have to put 0.9 volts on an electrode, 900 millivolts to oxidize the cobalt two to three, and then the self assembles and spontaneously forms. To run the water splitting reaction by the catalyst, I put 1.4 volts on the catalyst. The thermodynamic potential is 1.2. So, when the catalyst is splitting water, I have 1.4 volts there. If some of the catalyst degrades, it gets reduced by biological stuff in the Charles River. It reduces the cobalt down to cobalt two, and it can start to fall apart. But as soon as I go to cobalt two stage, I only need 0.9 volts to get it back up to 0.3. I'm applying 1.4 to keep the catalysis going. So as soon as cobalt-2 gets reduced, before it can dissolve and go away, it gets re-oxidized back up to cobalt-3, and therefore it never, the catalyst never dies. And we've shown it. We can take the catalyst film and just run it. We, we actually did very careful experiments. We used cobalt-57, which is radioactive, and we ran the catalyst for like three weeks, and after three weeks of continual operation, we can only detect, I think, 0.001% cobalt in solution by radioactive tracing. And so the concept of self-healing, the papers are very complicated because we have to figure out all the mechanisms. But the simple line is you get a self-healing, a self-assembling catalyst that assembles at a potential less than the potential you need to do catalysis. And if you do everything right, like what those papers explain, then the catalyst never dies. It's always fixing itself, and its turnover number is infinite as long as it's out. Well, let's hope that helped the other listeners as much as it did me. We're about two minutes away from our appointed hour here, so I'll, I, we kind of like last words for both of you. I'll let you go first, Dan, and then I'll give Catherine really the last word. Any, any thoughts that you want to leave us with with respect to this field? Well, the, the one, one is that People should start looking at the hybrid biology and organic systems give rise to very fast biomass and photosynthesis, way past natural photosynthesis. That's number one. And then the bigger issue is, because I'm always, you know, I'm an energy person and I worry about carbon. If you then put fast growing biomass by playing this trick, interfacing energy science with agriculture, and it's fast-growing fast, fast growing biomass, you can do a lot of damage in the good way to the carbon budget, and that's a very good way to start sucking carbon out of the air. And I hope people will start moving. I should probably write a little review or perspective on this. I never do write those. But um, fast biomass, 
can lead to significant carbon sequestration. Okay, Catherine, the floor is yours for your last words. Um, I mean, I, I would just like to return to, um, I think the point that I, I hope was made and as part of my talk was, um, you know, really just that natural photosynthesis it results in this enormous diversity of chemistry. And, and I mean, that's, that's part of what Dan's done is, is tap into that diversity and, and take advantage of it. Um, but that, um, you know, oftentimes in, the, in an artificial system, it's focused on one fuel product and, and you know, that's for very good reason. But um, if we're gonna use natural photosynthesis as a model, we should really think about the flexibility that it provides and the way in which biology has managed to make energy carriers that can drive so many diverse chemistries, many of which are relevant to both our energy infrastructure and then also, you know, biomedical, <clears throat> uh, the biomedical fields, for example. And really that flexibility and that diversity and that richness of chemistry that's available to us uh, is really something I think where uh, we can think deeply about how to drive the field forward and, and use biology as an inspiration and, and understand its how how it manages these processes to to make uh, so many different products possible well thank you very much thank you both for a very interesting seminar and for the a very uplifting thoughts there at the end so it's always good to have something to be to look forward to right so thank you all uh jessica are you taking it back or ellen Yes, I just want to add my thanks to Dr. Brown and Dr. Nasera for very interesting presentations and great discussion. And I want to thank the audience for tuning in and just tune in May 11th when we have an, our next webinar in the series on opioid sensing. And I thank everyone again and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye.